Hi guys, welcome back. I thought I would do a little piece on offensive weapons in the UK because a lot of people may not realise that in 2019 these things became completely illegal to own even in your own home. So before that, uh, quite a few of these could be in private ownership and you could have, for instance, a knuckle duster at home and use it as a paperweight or something or have it as some sort of historic memorabilia and have it in, on the wall as a display piece or in a d display case. Uh, many people would have had those kinds of things as just items of unusual interest and stuff. They probably didn't have any, um, you know, nasty intentions with it. And I'm sure there are probably a lot of people that have still got stuff like this sat around in their houses and they have got absolutely no idea that they're breaking the law. So I thought I'd go through some of these. A lot of them uh, were made offensive weapons in 1988 and it was quite a bizarre time because if you guys like me remember back in the uh, 80s it was really popular with martial arts. The ninja sort of craze had come out, everyone was watching Bruce Lee films and the government had this really strange knee-jerk reaction. There weren't particularly any crimes at the time that were being committed with ninja weapons and whatever, but it was making a lot of news. You know, a lot of the newspapers were running stories on throwing stars just because these objects looked frightening and they kind of created this sort of standard clutch your pearls fear type response that the you know middle-aged mothers reading the daily mail would gasp in horror at such things and some of the things of course if you imagine when they were used originally in ancient times as weapons they would have been pretty grisly things so it's easy to kind of conjure up in people's minds this kind of graphic imagery and they obviously are straight away going to agree with the government and say yeah get rid of this stuff uh, but they don't take into account that a lot of people that would have that kind of thing are collectors, have interest in the culture and period of those times. They might be reenactors. They might be practicing martial artists. And there are actually some caveats in the law that give you defense to own some of this stuff if you are uh, indeed, you know, a proper collector. But that area gets really grey, you know, you're going to have, it's no good to kind of just have a couple of knuckle dusters sat around in your house and say, well, I kind of fancied collecting them. The chances are you're probably going to get nicked. Uh, you're going to have to go through some, you know, pretty official lines to become a collector of historic artefacts and such. Uh, probably link yourself to some museums and get yourself some sort of credibility and that might give you some defence. If you're in that situation, talk to a solicitor, talk to some people that are in, you know, doing that sort of thing with historical context so you can uh, do things properly. Don't just think that you've got a defense to own this stuff and then, you know, hand them a bit of paper you've written out yourself saying you've started collecting them. That is probably going to get you in a lot of trouble. I thought it'd be fun to go through this list. Some of them are absolutely hilarious. You know, it, you wonder who on earth was in charge of making these things offensive weapons and what on earth they were thinking when they did. I just cannot see criminals running around with a Kusiri Gamma and all these like weird things. But uh, let's go through. Some of them are fairly obvious. Some of them you might have and you don't even realise they're offensive weapons or you may have realised that they're offensive weapons but you haven't yet realised that you can't have them in your house. One of the issues with this type of law I've got is that you really, really have to keep an eye on, you know, what's going on in law. Uh, they, It's not something that gets sort of national publicity and they suddenly roll it out um, onto all news channels and all newspapers that people that have certain articles might suddenly become criminals by definition, by accident. Um, so you have to keep up to date and see what's going on. And the onus is really on you uh, at some point you might end up with a, what you think is a useful gardening tool like a machete and if that suddenly becomes restricted it's kind of your business to find out if that has become restricted. Ignorance is, is never a defence so there's no point turning up in court and saying well no one told me about it, I didn't realise the judge is going to really frown upon you saying that and he's not going to be impressed. In 1988 as I mentioned uh, these things were classified as offensive weapons. There's been some updates to that and in 2019, 
it did become then illegal to possess these things in your home. So in 1988, you certainly couldn't walk around in the streets with them, but if you had one at home, you could keep it at home. 2019, that all changed. You can't do that anymore either. I'll stick a link up to the changes that were made in 2019 because there's a lot of information there, way too much for me to go through in this video. That will tell you about some of the caveats and the, the possible defences you may have for owning some of this stuff. And it also goes into great detail about the, the law in regards to various different items. So section 141 of the Criminal Justice Act 1988 provides it as an offence for any person to manufacture, sell or hire, offer for sale or hire, expose or have in his possession for the purpose of sale or hire, or lending or giving to any other person the certain specified weapons. So basically note in that that they weren't saying it was an offence to own for the, the private individual. They're basically saying in 1988, you know, you couldn't sell these things anymore. You couldn't manufacture them for sale anymore. You couldn't give them to people. So anyone who had these things, they were stuck with them or they had to destroy them. They couldn't do anything with them. Then it goes on to list the specifics. So Article A, a knuckle duster. And that is a band of metal or other hard material worn around one or more fingers and designed to cause injury and any weapon incorporating a knuckle duster. Now this is an interesting one and it will affect the knife community and there's been a lot of to and fro in on this. So if you've got something like an old trench knife, you know, that was used in World War I and World War II that incorporate a knuckle duster on the handle, there were quite a few knives around that also were sort of mimicking that type of look. So it's entirely possible someone may have one of them and think, well, that's just a knife with some sort of finger um, cutouts on it or whatever. That would be classed now as a knuckle duster and that article alone is illegal to have in your house. You know, you cannot possess that anymore. So if you've got one, I would suggest destroying it. Um, it's, it's way too late to be handing that in now. You know, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. I think they wanted people to hand that in uh, not far off of this act coming out. So you certainly wouldn't be getting a, a shake of the hand and a, a clap on the back from the local police officer if you turned up with one. The other issue with that is it kind of brings into question articles like karambits or any knife that basically has a, a thumb loop on it, you know, a, a finger hole. And a lot of those are not designed as knuckle dusters per se. They're designed to make sure the knife doesn't fall out of the user's hand or they're designed to make it so that the knife is easily extracted from its sheath or from the pocket and they don't really have anything to do with a knuckle duster. The problem is, it says in here, worn on one or more fingers. So in essence, a karambit is, you know, a, a ring, a metal ring that fits around one finger that would fall under the definition of a knuckle duster. B, a sword stick. That is a hollow walking stick or cane containing a blade which may be used as a sword. So I actually really used to love these when I was a kid. Uh, I didn't actually have one. I read a couple of books where these were featured and I was fascinated by the era in which they were popularised uh, back in the sort of Victorian era where these gentlemen were strolling around the streets and rich gentlemen would carry these sticks and use them as just walking sticks. They would contain a sword and they were generally used to fight off people that were trying to rob the rich. So there was a huge class divide at the time and people that were, you know, poverty stricken would see some rich guy walking down the street and think, yeah, he's, he's pretty ripe for nicking his wallet and watch and whatever else he had on him. So these rich guys would have these sword sticks, often incredibly ornate. They're really, really elegant and well-made things. Uh, but of course, they wanted to ban them because they are, in effect, a disguised blade. And uh, that bears, you know, that comes with it, all the implications of suddenly people are, are kind of whipping out a blade when you least expect it. To be fair, if a guy was walking around in 2023 and he looked able-bodied and he had a very ornate-looking walking stick with him, I think you would probably get the the picture that that was some sort of weapon anyway. So it's it's a bit different to back in the Victorian era where it was perfectly common for people to walk down the street with sticks. It was part of a fashion, you know, all gentlemen would have these type of walking sticks with the pommel type thing on top. 
Uh, so it was a clever way of disguising a sword, whereas nowadays, you know, you just don't see people unless they've got an obvious disability. No one's walking around with sticks. And even if you've got someone with an obvious disability, they're not often walking around with a ebony and silver ornate stick. C. The weapon sometimes known as a hand claw, being a band of metal or other hard material from which a number of sharp spikes protrude and worn around the hand. Now this was one of the really bizarre martial arts things from the 80s. So you had these claw things, they were kind of like a, a bear claw, and you could strap them around the hand. And from what I could make out, they were worn, uh, you know, by ninjas, etc., for basically climbing things. You know, they would make it easier for these guys to climb up structure, and they would also maybe utilize them as weapons if they really had to. But imagine back then, you know, they had access to way better weapons than that. You would pull a sword out. You wouldn't be trying to have fights with people that were probably armed with swords and sickles and all that kind of thing or a spear. And then you've got these like tiny little short bear claw things on your hands. It doesn't matter how good you are at martial arts. If the other guy's got a sword, he's probably going to chop your hands off before they get anywhere near him. So they were completely ineffective weapons. But the fact was, they looked really scary. You know, there are a couple of articles in the Daily Mail or whatever about, oh my God, these things should be banned. And that was it. They got added to the list. And uh, I don't think anyone will particularly have any of those sat at home. Uh, that Maybe uh, someone's got some and they use them as gardening implements or whatever. But yeah, I don't think this is very likely, but it is one of the most ridiculous bands. And again, criminals aren't going to be running around the streets using those. D, the weapon sometimes known as a belt buckle knife. So this is a fairly obvious ban, you know, disguised blades. Uh, the government don't like those. The police don't like them for obvious reasons. Airports don't like them. Security checkpoints don't like them because it's enabling someone to take a bladed article somewhere without it being seen. And that's got some, you know, consequences and connotations. In countries where you're able to carry around weapons and use them for self-defense, that has some utility that you don't want to look maybe like you are carrying a weapon because that could make you a target, but you want access to some sort of weapon to be able to defend yourself. Then these kind of disguised blades like a belt buckle knife might, might be very useful. If you're in a country that doesn't allow weapons for self-defense, and that is the UK, then that has no utility whatsoever and really would only suggest sinister motivation on the owner's part. Uh, again, it might be something that someone has as part of a collection, you know, some historical value. It's certainly a very interesting item. I'm fascinated by all that kind of thing and the history behind it, but it has no real use and utility in a country like the UK now, and for that reason, it got banned. E, the weapon sometimes known as a push dagger. And some of you guys, I think, might have seen these in films. And obviously in the US, you will be very much used to them. They're generally a small knife blade that extends from two fingers. And then it's got a T-bar shape on the other side. I'll try and get some pictures up so you guys can see what these things are if you don't know. And it's like a, a punch dagger. You know, you could basically punch it into someone. Again, it has no real utility as a tool. It is simply a fighting article and if you were in a country like some of the US states where you can walk around with these articles and use them for self-defense it very well has some utility that's not acceptable in the UK under current law so therefore it was banned I think a lot of these things will have been banned just because they're an obvious weapon with no actual utility to them at all no one could come up and say oh I use that for X and Y jobs or crafting or whatever it's very obvious what the thing's for so the government and the police did not want people to have access to them f the weapon sometimes known as a hollow kubatan being a cylindrical container containing a number of sharp spikes well <laughs> why on earth um, they would have added that is beyond me you know uh, the the container itself um that isn't particularly an issue. I mean, I've heard this time and time again. I've had it myself at an airport. I was, I had a metal pen at an airport and I had that confiscated because they said you could use this as a Kubatan. 
if people know about kubatans they can be used for martial arts they can be used in some sort of arkido type moves on pressure points and stuff like that you have to be incredibly skilled in martial arts to to use a kubatan effectively it would be way way easier just to go up and punch someone in the face and, and kick them in the balls you know the idea that a criminal could just get hold of this kubatan and suddenly he's be, you know like bruce lee and it's made him extra dangerous is ridiculous it, he just wouldn't know what to do with the thing it's a complex thing to learn and it would take years of practice so kubatans on their own you know i don't know why anyone's got an issue with them in effect they're just sort of tubular pieces of metal or wood but the thing containing the spikes uh you know obviously again it's clearly some sort of weapon it doesn't have any practical uses it's got no basically utility to it i don't know anyone who needs to carry a tube of spikes around with them it's very historically interesting it wouldn't surprise me if people collected those kind of things just because they're very cool but uh, the government don't care about that they just don't want you to have access to these things because they don't trust you and they don't think you're a big enough boy to play nicely with them G, the weapon sometimes known as foot claw, being a bar of metal or other hard material from which another a number of sharp spikes protrude and worn strapped to the foot. The same as the hand claw, you know, these articles were generally used for climbing trees and structures and stuff like that. Ninjas and martial artists were not running around with these claw things on their feet and then kicking people to death. That wasn't a thing and it never has been a thing. So these were simply banned because some crazy person in the government saw an article or saw a picture of them and decided that they looked terrific and they got rid of them. But criminals weren't running around with them on their feet. No one did any crimes with these things and it was the most ridiculous ban ever. H, the weapon sometimes known as a shuriken or death star, being a hard non-flexible plate having three or more sharp radiating points and designed to be thrown this is probably the one that most people heard about at the time. It was pretty widely publicised. It was in all the newspapers. If you read any of the articles, you would have thought that every criminal gang in the UK was going around throwing shuriken at each other. And they were all, you know, trained martial artists. Uh, in actual fact, it was more like, you know, the odd uh, teenager bought some from the back of a martial arts magazine and probably you know, got one stuck in his foot or something. Uh, there were, I'm sure there were plenty of accidents with young lads that had bought these things and tried to reenact their favourite martial arts film and injured themselves. But the criminals weren't running around with shuriken. Nothing like that was happening. The government simply did it to kind of uh, appease all the news stories that were coming out at the time, all these scare stories in the newspapers. So shuriken got banned. Meanwhile, you could have, you know, a spike and throw that just as easily with just as much effect. And in fact, if you go back to uh, some of the ancient Japanese stuff, you'll see that throwing spikes were just as widely used as throwing stars. Uh, but because spikes on their own, you know, weren't particularly scary looking, no one wanted to ban them. They just wanted to ban the, the you know, politicize the, the throwing star. I, the weapon sometimes known as a balisol butterfly knife, being a blade enclosed by its handle which is designed to split down the middle without the operation of a spring or other mechanical means to reveal the blade. This one has always been crazy for me because you have to be incredibly uh, experienced to even use a balisol properly. It is not a knife that any, you know, standard criminal would buy as a, an article to go and threaten people with because the most likely outcome for someone who doesn't know how to use a balisol is that they will really cut their own fingers very badly. So it would probably be a fairly good idea to allow criminals access to these and they would all end up with, you know, damage to their own hands and uh, very unlikely that they would succeed in damaging anyone else. Um... I've used them before when I was much younger. You know, we had a couple of them kicking around and I've also used practice ones. They're actually great fun. You know, it's a real skill that people sort of manipulate them and flick them around. It's really cool to see people doing all the tricks. There's a whole scene out there of people that do tricks and stuff with these, especially in America. And I don't know why on earth the government decided to ban them. 
you could buy a fixed blade with exactly the same blade length what makes a blade you know be, being revealed out by being spun around in a very um deft and experienced manner what makes that more dangerous than a fixed blade i would argue the fixed blade is way more dangerous because any idiot can pull a fixed blade out any idiot can you use that for nefarious intentions but you would have to dedicate a lot of time to pulling a ballast song out and using that successfully J, the weapon sometimes known as a telescopic truncheon, being a truncheon which extends automatically by hand pressure applied to a button spring or other device in or attached to its handle. So these are like the ASPs that the police use. Again, a pretty weird one. I think they just did this because they knew that the police were using them. They didn't want other people to have them as well. They wanted it as like a special thing for the police. But in reality there's no particular difference between one of those and like a metal rod and in fact i've been hit multiple times by an asp and although it did provoke a lot of bruising on my arm um it wasn't a very effective means of subduing me and i would have been a lot more concerned if that guy had pulled out like an iron bar because that would have snapped my arm and then it would have gone on to break my skull the asp it did not have enough power it has a lot of velocity but they're too light and too springy to actually you know do any severe impact they're very uncomfortable you wouldn't want to be hit by one but i was not in a great mood the, the guy that was hitting me with that when i was doing security work you know i was not very happy with him so i wasn't about to fall on the floor crying because my arm hurt a bit whereas if he had cracked me with a you know a piece of pipe a lead pipe or something I wouldn't have had much choice but to fall on the floor because I'd have probably been knocked unconscious. So a strange one to ban. I don't think they're particularly dangerous weapons. In fact, they're quite ineffective. They've been made in that manner so that the police can use them as like a pain compliance method with a low risk of doing anyone any serious damage. So the actual design of it itself is to mitigate serious damage to people. So I don't know why you would limit that. Probably because... Uh, again, there's no facility for having things for self-defense in this country and an extendable baton really doesn't have any other purpose other than for self-defense. K, and this is where things get really stupid. The weapon, sometimes known as a blowpipe or blowgun, being a hollow tube out of which hard pellets or darts are shot by the use of breath. Clutch your pearls, you know, the Amazonian tribe has descended upon London and they're going around darting people. That never happened. It never will happen. I don't think there's ever been any crimes committed with a blow dart gun. Um, they're actually a load of fun. You know, people that use them out in the States and other countries, um, they're pretty harmless things that people can do a bit of target practice with. A lot of young kids uh, get into kind of target-based sport doing those um they haven't got really any application they don't project darts at high enough velocity to kill anyone yeah you again you wouldn't want to be hit by a dart from a blowgun but they're not going to kill you the worst situation as my mum would say is be careful they're probably going to take someone's eye out so they got banned god knows why maybe someone watched a a film about a tribe deep in the forest that were hunting things with poison frog venom or something and they were worried that suddenly the gangs in hackney were going to uh, go and find some tree frogs and then poison everyone to death pretty bizarre i don't know any more than that but uh, yeah a real shame because they would have been pretty good fun things to have and, and mess about with and another ridiculous one l the weapon sometimes known as kasari gamma being a length of rope, cord, wire or chain fastened at one end to a sickle. So again, this object is something used in very niche martial arts, in ninjutsu, uh, bujinkan and stuff like that. And you would have to be incredibly experienced to utilise that successfully as a weapon. The most likely outcome of an idiot using one of these would be that he kind of sliced into his own neck with it because swinging a sickle round with any expertise on the end of a length of rope, the chances of you being able to hurt someone else with that are pretty minimal, unless you had studied for many years. 
Um, I have no idea who decided that should be added to the list or why. Uh, I don't think there's ever been any issues with those. Uh, there's probably been martial artists who have practiced with them and injured themselves and maybe injured some other people in the class. Uh, but that really falls down to a kind of health and safety aspect of that martial arts class rather than the fact that this should be struck off. But yeah, a, a strange one. I think that just became part of the 1988 general consensus that all martial arts weapons were bad. M, the weapon sometimes known as Kaiuketsu Shogi, being a length of rope, cord, wire or chain fastened at one end to a hook knife. So we're in the same sort of realms as we just spoke about for the Kusari Gama. Um, no criminals are going to particularly be using that. Uh, a, a very bizarre ban. And then N, the weapon sometimes known as Manrik Kisugari or Kusari, being a length of rope, cord, wire or chain fastened at each end to a hard weight or hand grip. So another bizarre one. They didn't seem to like anything that was fastened with rope. Uh, this one could really apply to quite a lot of stuff. If you tied any weight to a length of rope or a length of chain. So for example, if someone had a bike chain and they affixed a very heavy padlock to the end, and they were milling about with that, would that constitute one of these weapons? Um, I certainly think it would constitute an offensive weapon, you know, if you're walking around in public with it and you didn't have an excuse, but would it automatically fall into this Dangerous Weapons Act? And the same is someone that kind of uh, made themselves a, a weight on the end of a, a rope as some kind of um, toy or whatever. How far are we going down that road to say that that's illegal to possess in your own premises? Because remember, guys, you cannot possess these even in your own house. So if you tie some kind of uh, gym weight to the end of a rope and that is discovered and the police decide that falls within this uh, offensive weapons description, you could actually be charged and prosecuted. Oh, a disguised knife. That is any knife which has concealed blade or concealed sharp point and is designed to appear as an everyday object of a kind commonly carried on a person. So now we're getting into stuff that it's quite likely that people would have sat around at home. I remember years ago, uh, loads of people had things, you know, they'd imported when on holiday, they'd found things in Spain or France and whatever and bought them back. And you could get pens that retained knives um, you know, all sorts of things. I've seen lighters with a little knife in them. And all of those things would be considered a concealed blade in an item that is common. So if you've got one of those things, get rid of it. It's probably cheap tat anyway, although they're a lot of fun and they're kind of cool little things to own. Uh, it's not worth, you know, getting a, a criminal conviction for something that probably cost about £2.50 to make. It could be anything, you know, if you've got a knife that is in any way concealed as an inanimate object, you might be able to take the knife out and save that because the knife on its own is not per se illegal. It's the fact that it's concealable that's the problem. So if you remove the thing that conceals it and destroy that and you really, really wanted to keep the blade, I don't think that would be too much of an issue. But yeah, it's just not worth having that kind of stuff kicking around. P, a stealth knife. That is a knife or spike which has a blade or sharp point made from a material that is not readily detectable by apparatus used for detecting metal and which is not designed for domestic use or for the use in the processing, preparation or consumption of food or as a toy. So that is kind of wide reaching. And I think it was in response to, again, in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a lot of shocking news stories out about these uh, thick people were traveling through security checkpoints and they were able to get non-metallic objects through that were also weapons, so like a ceramic knife. And there was lots of rumors at the time about the Glock pistol being completely undetectable by aircraft x-rays. And that was actually rubbish. It was simply the, one of the first polymer-framed pistols there was nothing about that that meant it was undetectable because it still had many, many metal components in it, including the barrel. So that would be very, very obvious to people using a metal detector that you had something 
and also it had to have ammunition in it so uh that would be kind of obvious as well because they would see oh look there's a bunch of bullets you know the the bullets themselves would be hopefully enough to get you pulled out of line at the airport let alone the rest of it but yeah these ceramic knives you know uh got a bit of publicity uh they weren't particularly good knives i can't imagine why anyone would particularly want one but uh they're banned i don't really care that they're banned i think it's ridiculous that they are because as far as i'm aware no one's particularly running around with these things but i can understand that if your main sort of means of picking them up at a security checkpoint is with a metal detector i get that people are going to be nervous about that and they would want to eradicate those it does leave it pretty open-ended because in effect you could still buy one for food prep, you know, and I have seen them kicking around. I think I even saw a couple in TK Maxx once with the highly coloured blades and they were like all ceramic or whatever. So, uh, yeah, you know, there, there's nothing to stop someone with bad intention from just buying one for the purpose of food prep and then actually utilising it for something completely different. So the law's a bit of an ass there. I get what they were trying to achieve, but they haven't achieved it by the fact that they've left all these caveats in place. Q, a straight side handled or friction lock truncheon, sometimes known as a baton. If you used to watch TJ Hooker like I did in the 80s, you will remember uh, Captain Kirk throwing the uh, baton at escaping prisoners and criminals, and they would be tripped up by this thing as it spanned through the air. And he would do that and they would be like 100 metres away and then they would uh, trip over and he would go and arrest them. Uh, of course, in real life, this is just a piece of wood with another piece of wood on the side. Uh, I think it's called a tonfa in martial arts terms, but it is basically the standard American police type baton that was made famous. I don't even know if they have that type of baton over in America anymore. Uh, you would have to be highly skilled to make use of that in any specific way. Um, it's no more or less dangerous than the same size lump of wood or a baseball bat or a rounder's bat. Um, the fact that it's got a side handle on it is neither here nor there. Um, I don't know why they particularly went for that one. It probably was part of this sort of coal on martial arts implements that they were having at the time. R. A sword with a curved blade of 50 centimetres or over in length. And for the purpose of this subparagraph, the length of the blade should be straight line distance from the top of the handle to the tip of the blade. So this was in direct relation to samurai swords. And in fact, there were quite a few incidents that idiots got hold of samurai swords and then went on a bit of a crazy spree with them and were caught in public running around scaring people. I don't know of many instances where there was sort of mass... Um, mass slashings with them or anything like that but there certainly were idiots running around with these things because they were prolific you could buy a war hanger a cheap samurai sword for about 10 or 15 pounds that you would see them all over the place i even used to see them in second hand shops when i went out with my mum you know they were being what the equivalent of oxfam now you would find these things sort of sat there often in the display there would be sort of two of them in the classic sword display uh, the blades were awful. The moment that you hit anything with them, including probably another person, the blades would have snapped because they were... If you're going to make a blade that long, it has to be properly tempered. It has to be right, made out of the right steel. You know, it, it has to have all the right heat treat. That's vital. And if you don't do those things, it's way too long and the metal would just snap. That's why, you know, bladesmiths back in the day were highly skilled and highly paid people because they understood how to make a long piece of metal that wouldn't just uh, break on impact. But I get that they were responding to a problem at the time, which was idiots running around with them. And they've in effect banned the cheapened varieties because there is a caveat that says that swords that are made by traditional means, i.e., you know, handmade, folded steel, in all the sort of traditional Japanese manner that you would think a katana would be made in, or if it was a European sword, you know, forged properly in a kind of uh, open forge all by hand. In effect, all they've done is push over all the swords to be a little bit more expensive and to be made using traditional methods. So you can still buy katanas online in the UK. 
and they're perfectly legal for them to sell because they're made with traditional methods but instead of 15 pounds they're going to cost you like 250 pounds because it's going to cost a lot more to make them that is one of the ones that people are very very likely to fall foul of because i'm sure there's many people with really cheapo swords sat on the wall that weren't traditionally made and they don't even consider them weapons they've probably got some old ass sword hanging on the wall it looks really cool they don't think anything of it but in effect now they are breaking the law and they could face some pretty serious stuff over that i don't think they would go to prison in that case but they could you know it's that the law could certainly extend to that uh, but they would certainly end up with a criminal record probably a very large fine maybe some sort of uh, community restorative order or something but whatever it is you do not want a criminal record for some crappy old sword that you've got hanging on the wall so my suggestion would be take it out stick it in a vice you know basically bend it up and ruin it and uh, if you can if you've got the means chop it up into pieces if you've got a grinder or something or if you've got uh, some sort of metal chop saw then just chop the thing up if you know any builders and they've got that kind of kit, get them to chop it up for you and dispose of it, throw it away. Then we're getting into more modern times. S, the weapon sometimes known as zombie knife, zombie killer knife or zombie slayer knife. Being a blade with a cutting edge, a serrated edge and images or words, whether on the blade or handle, that suggest it is to be used for the purpose of violence. So that was in direct relation to all the gangs running around with these ridiculously cheap knives that tended to be branded in zombie fashion. And they often have like blood splatter and green handles and then the word zombie on them somewhere. And uh, those type of knives have been banned. It was a very strange ban because it focused completely on aesthetics. And in effect, you could then make a knife that didn't have words on it, that didn't have maybe... A serrated edge you know it only had a, a straight edge so in effect it's a cheap ass machete and you could sell that perfectly legitimately but then change that round stick some words on it and stick two types of edge on it and suddenly it's banned uh, a ridiculous ban i understand why but the solution to those youths running around like idiots and they're sort of uneducated feral uh you know future criminals the solution to that is not to ban a certain aesthetic type of knife. The solution is to deal with why are these young people going off the rails? What's causing it? How can you bring them back into normal society? How can you prevent their antisocial behaviour? Those are the real answers to the issue. T, the weapon sometimes known as a cyclone knife or spiral knife, being with a handle, a blade with two or more cutting edges which form a helix, and the sharp point at the end of the blade. So, you know, these things were kind of um, becoming popular a couple of years ago. I saw a lot of posts on them. They are clearly a knife designed for puncturing and doing, you know, severe damage. Hence their ban. They've got no practical use whatsoever. Obviously, to collectors, they might be of interest to people that are kind of knife nuts or whatever like i'm a bit of a, a knife nut myself i'm very interested in knives that are well engineered and beautiful looking uh, i didn't personally have any interest in these but if people did you know fine for them uh i can imagine why they were banned because they've got no practical use but i don't imagine that there would be a huge amount of criminals going out and buying them they were never cheap you know the, there was only a couple of companies as far as i know that were making these things and they certainly weren't cheap things to buy and my argument would be what's the difference if i was being stabbed and someone stabbed me with a kitchen knife from audi versus one of those things i'm not very happy either way and uh, it doesn't really help me that you've banned a spiral thing and then I'm being slashed and stabbed with a, a kitchen knife that costs two ninety nine. You know, it, it's all the same thing. I hope that was of, in, of some interest to you. Uh, some of it made me laugh, you know, when I was thinking back about my time in the 80s, jumping about in my pyjama pants, pretending to be Bruce Lee. And some of it just makes me laugh because you've got to wonder about the regulators of this stuff and where they were getting their ideas from. And it, it just uh, stinks of a nanny state. You know, there's no reason why people shouldn't be able to own stuff just to have a look at because they've got interest in it. 
they might have a collection of those things on the wall whatever you know no one should be caring too much about that and uh there's no reason why people shouldn't be having a mess about with blow pipes and doing some target practice with them it's a good fun activity and i'm really really unhappy with the sort of nanny state that we've gotten into where people think that that's somehow preventing crime you know most of those things that we've just read out are not going to prevent any crime as we've seen we now live in absolutely crime ridden times most of those things were banned in 1988 and people are running around slashing at each other with kitchen knives they're running people over in vans they're running people over in cars you're never going to prevent violence by picking on inanimate objects because even if you banned magically every single inanimate objects those idiots would be running around kicking and punching people so we have to look at the root cause it's pointless to level all these problems at the objects themselves i hope you enjoyed have a great weekend i'm going to be doing a couple more videos so uh, keep tuned on the channel please subscribe i'm going to do a bit of fitness content as well a bit more of this stuff about legislation and weapons and whatever and then i'm going to be also covering a couple of really cool new knives that i've got that i think you guys are going to enjoy have a great one i'll see you all soon